with recalling the beginnings of category theory. Everybody knows of uh, the paper by Eilenberg and McLean, 1945. But then there was an important paper by Pierre Samuel of Bourbaki Group in 1948 about three groups. He introduced probably for the first time uh, the unique factorization as a definition of a concept. There were no diagrams, but this was this language. He referred to structures as presented in Bourbaki's first volume in 1939. He was from Bourbaki's group. Then very important, well, uh, category theory was used for a long time, uh, mainly in, for algebraic topology and uh, uh, homological algebra. But there was a paper in 1950 by McLean, Duality for Groups, uh, where there was an uh, opening towards what is uh, now understood as category theory. Uh, for instance, the concept of what is a dual notion, uh, diagrams for products and coproducts drawn explicitly, and a lot of things which are well known. Uh, then, uh, well, uh, 57, there was a paper by Grotendieck, uh, Circle Point d'Algebra Homologique, 100 pages, uh, and a first dramatic change, in my opinion, was a paper by Daniel Kahn in 58, where the concept of a joint functor was. This was the first really new concept because previously category theory was a new language, new settings, but for things which were understood uh, before. The, uh, by the way, at this time, uh, people, uh, many people had the attitude that the category theory is such a new fashion, I don't like it. I would keep away. Uh, and probably this was somehow akin to what was half a century earlier with such theory that mathematicians, some mathematicians uh, disliked set theory in early 90s. Uh, then. And then, well, I met, uh, I learned some part of category theory during my stay at the University of Washington in Seattle. This was 1961-62, that means 55 years ago. Uh, and uh, I immediately became enthusiastic of this. this uh, uh, there was uh, uh, in six, and then there was an acceleration of development of category theory. Around uh, 63, there was doctoral dissertation by William Lovier, directed by Eilenberg in New York. In uh, 64, there was book, first book, A Billion Categories by Peter Freud. And, uh, and then, oh, uh, let me give such an example. In 1963, there was a book by MacLean, Homology. And many years later, I read a paper by Jean Piaget on psychology. And in the bibliography, there was MacLean's Homology. 
Why? Because Piaget wanted to say something about category theory. And there was no book to which he could refer. So he took this homology, which of course had nothing to do with psychology, well, uh, and, and for normal person absolutely unreasonable. Mm, uh, okay, so, and then uh, there was this beginning of quick development. Now I will start, uh, this is some lack of, uh, um, can this be somehow larger? And focus. Uh, well, Cantorian mathematics. So this this normal mathematics, uh, like algebra, topology, function analysis. Oh, yeah. oh, still more. You you have plenty of space. Can you? Oh, uh, category theory is symmetric in this sense that each notion has a dual notion. Perfect symmetry. If somebody knew only category theory, everything would have a nice dual. But Cantorian mathematics is specifically asymmetric. Let me consider some examples. These are categories and how products and coproducts are constructed. For sets is Cartesian product, disjoint union. And uh, for topological spaces the same. A topology is such that each member is open closed and he has he, its original topology. Pointed topological spaces, well, base point in the product and quotient to make in this disjoint union all uh, base points together. Now, compact Hausdorff spaces. Cartesian product and the same as before, but it's in case of infinite families not compact. We take stone check compactification. And then groups. Cartesian product again and free product of groups. Abelian groups. Cartesian product again and direct sum. That means a subgroup of the Cartesian products, which all but a finite number of coordinates, it's, it's only the unit of uh, the group. And compact abelian groups, again the same, and uh, in case of infinite uh, sum, you take the Bohr compactification. Bohr compactification is a reflector from uh, topological, uh, let's say, abelian topological groups to compact groups, akin to stone compactification. And let us see, and the left is always the same, Cartesian product. While on the right, there are, well, here are somehow similar up to this, but, well, these groups, look, abelian groups, it's a full subcategory. And the coproduct is absolutely different. Here is free product. Strongly non commutative. And uh, now take this pair. In the theory of 
locally compact uh, abelian groups, there's a duality, Pontiagin's duality. To each group, you can assign characters, that is, continuous homomorphism into the unit circle group. And the group of characters is a dual group. If you take the second dual, you get back something equivalent to the original one. So, abelian or abelian discrete groups is dual to this. But in spite of this, you might expect that in dual it should be opposite. No. Again, products are Cartesian products and coproducts are different. Well, Banach spaces and linear operators, linear contractions. Then we have the L infinity product. That means all those the families of elements that the supremal norm is used. And uh, the coproduct is L1. Well, modeled both on the products and coproducts of um, the field of real or complex numbers. Well, this looks like not a Cartesian product, but unless a, a subset. But we may take not the whole Banach spaces, but only unit balls, closed unit balls. See, it's equivalent category. And if you take only, again, you get Cartesian product. That means the categorically proper uh, forgetful functor for Banach spaces is not the whole linear space, but only unit ball, and then it's n fit nicely. Take commutative C star algebras with units and unit preserving homo homomorphisms. Uh, this is again L infinity program and the so-called injective tensor uh, product. This is dual to compact space, like Gelfand duality. To each compact space you have the space of continuous func algebra of continuous functions. And to each commutative sister algebra you get back compact spaces. And again, we have the same feature as with uh, group, to, to, to this abelian and uh, groups, compact and discrete. Oh, let, let's say another example, Mili automata, uh, this input alphabet set of states, output alphabet, transition function, output uh, function. And uh, we have Morphies are from such axis to another. It is here this way, such that everything commutes. And again, we have products are Cartesian products in each part separately. And it's a very tricky construction of coproduct. Uh, they may be two finite automata, and coproduct is infinite. Yes, uh, it's a question. Why is it so? This big, these were facts, hard facts. Now it begins philosophy. Is there? Can we explain this? Why is this asymmetry of uh, this? Um, mathematical theories if we look from categorical point of view. Well, asymmetry of sets. Oh yes, of course, element set are completely asymmetric. Many, one, like in Plato. Many becomes one. The 
essence of such theory is that many becomes one as one single object. Yeah. And hierarchy of sets are asymmetric. No, but this is not the point. Uh, let's look at this category. Sets and binary relations. Objects are sets, morphs are relations, and composition of relations, standard one. The empty set is zero object. And now, what are products and coproducts? Coproduct, well, is disjoint union, as in sets. Product is the same, except of those maps go into the opposite direction. This is no surprise, because binary relations are perfectly symmetric. So the fact that we in the triple, uh, we write first A, then B, it's just a matter of convention. So product and coproduct. Aha, uh -huh, and perhaps this is the reason that this lack of symmetry follows from asymmetry many to one in the concept of the function. Uh -huh. Many to one. Mathematics is based on the concept many to one. Of course, not only, but the most important. Now, why does this uh, dominate in mathematics? Uh, certainly, this kind of thinking is deeply rooted in our minds. But uh, this question, why is it so deeply rooted? So, well, it may be evolutionary effect of mathematical thought. Or thought in general. Or, or perhaps it's a consequence of some features of mathematics, of nature. No, and to what extent this uh, follows from the direction of subjective time. Because it's goes uh, no, and let's consider causality. Effect may have many causes. Causes generally precede the effect, at least in uh, our typical thinking. And this in ordinary language it is so. Moreover, when we have a theorem, they some, there are some pre premises, two at least, usually, or more, and generally it's one conclusion. If there are many conclusions, you may discard, but you cannot discard premises. Uh -huh. Again, we have many premises, one conclusion. A function, well, you have inputs and outputs, and let's take children's arithmetic, well, like 4 plus 3 is 7, well, this function addition is not invertible, of course, because it's a function of two variables. The basic direction in thinking of children and thinking of adults is from summons to the input. The opposite, we can go, of course. This is called uh, decomposing a number into summons. It's, of course, important, but definitely secondary. Primary is addition. Analysis of func functions. Of course, uh, we may consider the inverse relation, but Again, it's secondary. Uh, set theory is perfectly static. It's something which is not so much uh, uh, 
spoken about that. And uh, I remember the middle of 20th century time, uh, together with uh, special coordinates. Uh, well, in the history of mathematics, time was uh, part of mathematics. And uh, mechanics was, well, uh, together with mathematics, were together. And at the University of Warsaw still, oh, uh, still are mathematics and mechanics. But in the, I remember the uh, Moscow Congress, 1966, International Congress of Mathematicians, there were four field uh, medals. There was uh, Grotendieck, uh, Paul Kochen, Atiyah and Smey. And I realized at that time that in none of this paper there was any physics. Thirty years later, at the Congress in Kyoto, there were four field medals and three of them were for quantum field theory. <laughs> so time came back to mathematics. But in the new math, it was completely discarded. And this is why the function uh, was... Well, um, the Moscow Congress uh, was Maclean, and he organized an informal meeting, meeting rather than seminar, of all people interested in category theory. They were, at this time, they were dispersed people in some places in the world, which are very interested in this. And uh, Maclean asked whether we could somehow organize the exchange of ideas. And as a result, there was uh, some kind of uh, secretariat of, of this category theory organized and placed in Prague. And I remember there was Viera Trnkova and Zdenik Hedlin and some people in Prague. In, this was organized around 1967. Oh, this was uh, still early time of this. Okay, so let me stop with this here and thank you. Thank you for this truly metaphysical <laughs> You could have, if you take co-algebras, not algebras, then it's converse, yes? so co-products are easy and products are bad. So you have this asymmetry in a different way if you take no under quality So how how it fits with this framework? No. So this is our precise choice of structure, so that's something deep behind. It's interesting, but I don't know. No. Interesting to mark which should be perhaps think over. Uh, okay, some other questions. This is like in philosophy. Uh, questions and no answers. <laughs> <laughs> if I am permitted I have a question but uh, related to your related to your historical remarks. Uh, I was studying I, I met for the first time category theory from your textbook with Wieweger. I am interested how it was that this book was written. Well, first I wrote a, I wrote a book on Banach spaces of continuous functions and there was a big 
chapter of categories and also I started uh, for instance uh, topology general topology developed uh, with categorical definition that means what uh, that means what is the definition of the object and then what kind of topology should be there to become this was uh, for um, typical mathematicians very difficult to read this inverse of uh, time and then well Viveger uh, was interested in first in function analysis and then in category theory so we collaborated uh, he was handicapped after the Heine Medina so this was a miracle that he uh, managed to study at the University of Warsaw uh, his colleagues had to take him to the Palace of Culture uh, uh, carrying him to lifts yeah, at the time uh, and he, he was a student of Professor Sikorsky and um, well and, but uh, later I started to work on math education and uh, stopped to well uh, I, I attended several conferences on category theory and um, I but mainly I was interested in seeing how we, these categorical ideas uh, can be seen in a specific uh, for instance uh, there was a general theorem of Peter Fried that um, limits exist but I wanted to know how they are constructed in very specific categories sometimes very interesting uh, yeah. uh, for instance uh, uh, at, a, at a conference I gave a proof of the theory that um, uh, the category of compact spaces is monadic uh, but there was purely topological proof that means uh, there was a topological theorem which uh, this was I spoke to topologists who didn't know category theory but so uh, I was interested in uh, in um, in such finding but uh, one couldn't uh, go for too long with uh, educ full time education problems problems small children first of all that means uh, age 6 to 10 and I'm still interested in this okay so this is why you were interested in Piaget yes yes <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thank you again.